Hi guys, how are you there? I hope you are still healthy and happy. Uh, let's continue with our uh, topic on discourse analysis. Today we are going to talk about advertisements as it is related to inference, and then we are going to move on to uh, some of the new next topics. Let's see my PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, this is the topic for today. Advertisements, speech acts, writing and reading positions. And this refers to the textbook on pages 141 up to 159. So I would recommend that you read those pages first and understand uh, to the best of your ability. And then you, you'll be able to follow this lecture uh, better. Okay, let's start with um, adverts and inferencing. Let's start with adverts and inferencing. Um, so the effectiveness of an advertisement actually depends on its power to make the audience infer the desired message. So remember the inference, um, it is the ability to know or to understand what lies behind the words or the sentences or the utterances by a speaker. Inferring means being able to know what is actually the implied message. Now that works very well with advertisement. If you are able to infer properly, then the advertisement um, works effectively. So um, in principle, advertisements makes us or the customers infer that by buying the product, we buy other things displayed in the ads too. Second, by buying the product, we acquire a certain social status. And by buying the product, we enjoy the situation or the atmosphere being displayed in the ads. These are the three things that the advertisement the advertisement wants us to infer. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see the example here. See this one. So if you look at this advertisement, actually this advertisement wants you to infer that if you buy the jeans, you will be able to acquire the social status of this um, lady and this guy in the picture. Yeah. You even uh, infer to that uh, you will look as as cool as they as they do, as beautiful as they do. Yeah. Also, um, the advertisement wants you to infer that if you buy the jeans, you will be able to acquire the situation here, the atmosphere here. Somehow, you will feel the same atmosphere if you. Um, um, by the products, and that's the inference, the power of inference, okay? Um, let's go to the next one, and we are going to skip this. Now the next one is um, chapter five, actually. This talks about reading and writing positions, meaning that every time you read, you are actually positioned in a certain way by the writer. If you listen to someone, uh, you are actually positioned in such a way yeah, to acquire a certain position by the speaker. Yeah. For example, as I'm speaking to you now, I position you as somebody or people who do not know much about discourse analysis, and that's why I give you a long lecture on the topic. Yeah, that's the way I position you. Yeah. So uh, the subject positions here is the position for the reader and writer through a text. In, in, in a text, the writer always gives the reader a certain positions and the readers always are always placed in a certain position. It can be a passive person can be uh, people who do not know anything, 
or people who know uh, very little about something, uh, people who are bad, yeah, people who are depressed, for example, if it is an advice for a depressed uh, person. So it's various kinds of positions for the reader. Throughout a text, a writer may adopt uh, several positions. So if you read a text, you may realize that um, in some parts of the text, the writer talks to you or writes to you as a friend. And in another part of the text, he or she might adopt uh, the role of a reviewer. He reviews your life. Uh, he reviews your work. He reviews your habits. Yeah. And then suddenly, uh, he or she switches to a parent who gives you uh, comfort, who counsels you on uh, personal issues and things like that. And then at some point, he or she would probably be a psychologist offering you advice, yeah, offering you um, what to do, what to think, how to feel, things like that. So again, uh, this is several positions that uh, the writer may adopt throughout uh, a text. The writer may also do several speech acts. We are going to do we are going to study later what speech act is, but uh, throughout the text, the writer may inform you or instruct you to do uh, certain things or complain, etc. Yeah, so these are the speech acts. Okay, now let's move on to the next one. Okay, uh, as I said before, we are going to study speech acts. Yeah, speech acts is actually um, the utterances and the sentences that we make are actually acts, yeah? much like uh, sitting or kicking or running or watching. Yeah? It's, it's just acts, yeah? acts in the form of speech. That's speech acts simply defined. And it affects our listeners or our readers. Now, there, there are several speech acts. First is Assertive. Assertive means when you give information to someone. Yeah. For example, I'm a student at Majung. That's, that's when you are doing an assertive act. You, you give information to somebody else. Directive means you tell someone to do something. Please close the door. It's too windy outside. Now you direct someone to, to do something. That's directive. Commissives is uh, promising something. I promise I will study harder. Yeah, if you say to me, uh, when you, your quiz bizarre, um is very low, uh, you probably will say, okay, sir, I, I promise I will study harder for the next uh, big quiz. That's a promise, that's uh, commissives. And then expressive, when you express your feelings, we have learned how human beings express feelings by using language, you can swear yeah? if you are angry, if you are disappointed. Uh, you probably uh, conceptualize your feelings. Yeah? You know those kinds of things. Uh, language which is used to express your feelings. That's expressive. And then declarative. We see this in a, some formal ceremony because uh, by saying something. Uh, the speaker changes a state or a condition. For example, in a trial, uh, the judge will say, we find the defendant not guilty. Or in a marriage ceremony, the pastor will say, I pronounce you husband and wife. Now, at that moment, something happens. Uh, in the case of the pastor, uh, the bride and the bridegroom at that point becomes husband and wife, okay? That's declarative. So these are the speech acts that you are going to deal later from time to time in discourse analysis. Um, in speech acts, there are three aspects. Uh, first is uh, locutionary. Yeah, locutionary is the, the actual words that are spoken or written, the actual words. The second one is elocutionary. Elocutionary is the propositional attitude. 
or what the speaker or the writer really means, what they really wants. Yeah, that's the elocutionary. Uh, perlocutionary is the effect. See, this is the effect of the speech on the receiver or the reader or the, the listener. Yeah, so again, this is the effect. Yeah, most likely, it's going to be non-verbal. Yeah, of course, it can be verbal as well, but uh, some of the effect can be non-verbal too. For example, let's say uh, this example, father says to the son, mobilnya sudah kotor. Again, this is the, the locutionary is this sentence, this sentence, mobilnya sudah kotor. That's the actual words uh, being spoken or written. Yeah. Locutionary, what does the father uh, mean to say? Yeah. The father wants his son to wash the car. That's the elocutionary of this uh, speaker. Yeah, by saying mobilnya sudah kotor, actually the father intends to tell his son to wash the, uh, the car because it's already dirty. Yeah. And then the perlocutionary is the son gets up from uh, his seat and then washes the car. Uh, this is the perlocutionary. This is the effect of this utterance on his behavior. On uh, hearing the father's utterance, uh, the son uh, understands the elocutionary um, act of the father. He knows that his father wants him to wash the car, and so she, he gets up and washes the car. That's perlocutionary. Okay, so these are three speech acts aspects. Um, yeah, we have an indirect speech act yeah. for the sake of politeness. Sometimes a speech act can be indirectly expressed through certain grammatical structures. So um, if we want somebody else to feed the dog, we are not going to say directly, feed the dog. It's probably come across as very uh, direct and it's, it's not it's not polite. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's not comfortable to hear either. So instead of saying "feed the dogs," you would say "the dog needs to be fed." Now this is a declarative sentence, right? Uh, the dog needs to be fed. But actually, your elocutionary, yeah, your intended meaning is that you want the other person to feed the dog. <laughs> See. This is the indirect speech act. Yeah, command disguised as a, a declarative sentence. Or you can say declarative um, sentence as an indirect question. You went to Starbucks last night. Well, actually, what you mean, what you intend to do is asking him or her, did you go to Starbucks last night? But if you do that, that becomes that comes across as interrogating. It's probably uh, you are going to make the other person feel uncomfortable because he or she feels like being interrogated by you. So instead of saying, instead of asking, did you go to Starbucks last night? You say, you went to Starbucks last night. Again, as a declarative sentence. Although actually you mean it's a question. Yeah. So, so these are the examples of how speech acts can be indirect. Um, okay, so when we want to ask someone to do something, um, you have several factors to consider. Yeah. Um, when you ask, when somebody asks somebody else to do something, it is actually uh, based on the cost and benefits for the sender and the receiver. So when you want to, you when you want somebody else to do something for you, you will consider whether it is a request or an offer. Yeah. If it is a request, it is costly for the receiver. Yeah. If you say to me. Um, um, 
give me a quest besar susulan. That, that is costly for me because I'm going, I'll have to spend some time making uh, the problem for the quest besar susulan. Well, an offer is a benefit for the, read, for the receiver. Would you like a coffee? Now that's an offer. And that's actually, if you ask that to me, that's actually a benefit for me. Okay. Uh, power factor. If the receiver has more power, uh, has more authority, the speaker should be more polite, of course. Again, if you ask me, um, you would say something like, uh, if you don't mind, sir, uh, can I get some quiz uh, besar susulan? And that is more polite because you know that I have more power, I have more authority as a lecturer than you are. And then, okay, medium degree of contact, forget this is not very important, but uh, the, very f the, uh, the first two are important when you want to uh, ask someone to do something. Okay, we have uh, another one. Uh, it's called Leach's Maxims for Politeness. So there is a, an expert uh, whose name is Leach and he proposed uh, maxims for politeness. Uh, he thinks that in every human interaction, there is a certain degree of politeness involved because we are human beings. We don't want to come across as rude or impolite. So we want to make our sentence, make our utterance as polite as possible. So you have tact. Tact is uh, indirectness or optionality. Indirectness means that you phrase your request uh, indirectly. And optionality is when you ask someone to do something, you give options to them. The option can be yes, they, yes, they want to help you, or no, they don't want to help you. So there, there is always that choice given to uh, the person you are asking, the, the person you are directing to do something. You can see the visual on page 152 and study it yourself. And then the next one is appropriation. Appropriation say, means that we say that the, the receiver, yeah, the the reader or the listener is better, is smarter, is wiser, has more knowledge, etc. Yeah. For example, we can say in a letter that kami paham bapak adalah pakar di bidang ini, things like that. Yeah, that's appropriation. Majesty, majesty means that uh, we say we, we acknowledge that we are of a lesser quality. We we are still learning. We are not expert yet. Yeah, we, we don't know much about the issue. Yeah, in a letter, it could be expressed by saying, uh, "Kami masih perlu belajar banyak tentang hal ini dari lembaga Bapak. Things like that. That's that's a reflection of modesty. Agreement. Uh, sometimes we, even when we disagree with someone, we uh, always attempt to express our agreement, although it's not fully a full agreement, but, was, but just a partial agreement. Yeah. For example, we can say, kami setuju bahwa uh, mahasiswa harus belajar secara, uh, secara uh, online, misalnya. Yeah. Things like that. Uh, so the essence is that it is, it is an obligatory for us to partly agree with the person we are talking to. And then sympathy, sympathy means that we express uh, the feeling or we, we say that we can feel what the receiver is feeling. Yeah, for example, kami paham masalah yang sedang anda hadapi. That kind of thing is an expression of sympathy. So these are uh, the maxims for politeness. If you are a public relation, if you are in a communicating communication business later in your workplace, you might uh, look back at these principles and apply 
the principals to uh, send letters to involve to, to engage in a debate, for example, or in an argument. Uh, you can apply this. This this is the maxims that will make you sound polite. Okay. Okay. Now we come to the next one. It is the. Um, learning and resisting reading positions as i said before when you read something actually you are put in a in a certain position yeah. but you can resist that positions you can say uh, you can say something like no i don't agree with your point of view for example you can say that to the writer or to the speaker in other words, you are resisting the reading positions. You are refusing the reading positions given by the speaker or the writer. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if you read this kind of text, yeah, you can read it yourself. I'll give, I'm giving you a certain um, a few moments to read. Okay, so as you read this, actually, you have to be aware that you are put in a certain position. Yeah. You are put in a, in, a, in, a, in a position of somebody who uh, likes K-pop so much. Yeah. And you know that uh, this essay is a criticism against K-pop. Yeah. And then you can resist this position. You can say, uh, to the writer or you can make a note yeah i don't agree with this yeah. there is a certain value offered by k-pop of course it has some positive values that we need to uh, to learn we need to see yeah. you can resist that positions and that's what is meant by learning and resisting reading positions okay yeah uh, you know annotate annotate is uh, you write down in a margin you uh, make a scribble on the margin of whatever you are reading and then you annotate it your annotation your writing or your scribble on the margin reflects how you react to the text how you resist the content of the text for example um, while you are reading a certain essay, you would uh, scribble on the margin. I don't agree with this, things like that. Yeah. Or you can uh, write another script, another note. Yes, this is good. Yeah. And then if you read, you read along and then you find another part which you disagree, and then you would write, uh, I don't quite agree with this. Yeah. This is outrageous and things like that. Yeah. So by doing that actually you are practicing the resisting of uh, reading positions you you resist the reading positions you think critically and then you put your comments on the margin and that's what is meant by annotating of course uh, my whole lecture here makes sense if you have read the pages in the textbook so please do read those pages so that you will make sense of whatever I'm lecturing here. Okay, we skip this. Okay, that's what will be for the next lecture. Okay, so guys, um, that's the, uh, the topics for today. Uh, you have learned, okay, can you mention what you have learned so far from my lecture? Yeah, you have learned uh, advertisements and inference, right? Advertisements and inference. Realize that advertisements always makes you infer something. Yeah? And then you have you have also have learned uh, reading and writing positions. Every time you read something, every time you listen to something, you are being placed in a certain position by the sender. 
that's the written positions and then speech acts it's actually whatever you do with language actually is uh, comprises an act and we have learned several types of speech acts we have learned the locutionary the elocutionary and the perlocutionary aspects of speech act okay. and then we also learn how to uh, instruct someone in a polite manner okay. you have some degree of politeness here uh, you also have learned Lynch, Lynch maxims for politeness so the principles that you need to apply whenever you want to request something politely when you want to direct somebody's behavior politely when you want to debate somebody's point of view politely when you want to express disagreement politely uh, these are the areas with in which you can apply leads maxims and then uh, we also finally you have learned that you can always resist the reading positions given to you by the writer you can put it in annotation annotations means writing a note on the margin of the text or if you are listening you can write a note uh, on your gadget or on a piece of paper which essentially means essentially contains your own argument about the content being discussed that's uh, resisting the, the positions okay okay that would be all um, guys i hope that you have understood uh, that lecture it's a bit long uh, packed with uh, concepts but i believe that if you read the textbook uh, and understand it well and follow uh, my lecture uh, you will be you will understand it things uh, clearly and better okay uh, stay healthy stay safe and goodbye for now